Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Ken Hirsch. Welcome. President Bush, Mrs. Bush, thank you for hosting this evening's program, and we're excited for a couple of reasons. We get to celebrate the Stand To Veteran Leadership Program scholars, and we get to expose them to so many people in our community who've been so generous to support the work that we do. I want to obviously thank the board members of the Bush Center who are in attendance for their uh, unwavering support, and to thank the founding program underwriter of the Veterans Leadership Program, the Boeing Company. Without that kind of support, uh, we couldn't uh, really bring together these kinds of groups of people to do the magical things that they're doing. Our mission here at the Bush Center is to engage communities around the world by developing leaders, advancing policy, and taking action to address today's most pressing challenges. And this program has it all. This program is a, peer, is a, is a point of engagement that's beyond the scope of this center. The multiplier effect from the work that these uh, scholars do uh, is um, unbelievably motivating for all of us who get to work on this program every day. And my goal at the Bush Center is to make sure that we connect the work that we do with the people who support it. So I wanna thank all of the people who are here tonight because everybody here has a role in bringing this program to life. We're inspired by our 43 veterans leadership scholars. That's only a mild coincidence. <laughs> and I want to thank Holly Kuzmich, the executive director of the Bush Institute, and her leadership team, led by Lindsay Knudsen, and Matt Amidon, Colonel Amidon, and his team at our Military Service Initiative, who brought everything together to make this program a real winner. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's a 12. Tonight's program is going to be awesome. We're going to hear from Admiral James Stravides and our director of Military Service Initiative, Colonel Matt Amidon and for, that's for the second Boeing lecture uh, in this program. And you're gonna hear from one of our scholars, Jen Anthony. And now, it's my honor to introduce the 43rd President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ken, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here and thank you for supporting the Bush Center. Uh, so the challenge, of course, is are you able to do anything that advances uh, the country? And one of the things we're good at here is taking uh, lessons from leadership and uh, helping others realize those lessons. Uh, and today, Laura and I just had a chance to meet with the Stand To uh, leaders and listen to their stories and answer their questions. And this is an incredibly impressive group of people. After the Vietnam War, uh, our veterans were uh, not treated well. The people basically um, said, we don't agree with the war, and we don't agree with you being in the war. And it was a really shameful period for our country. A lot of really good people didn't receive the help they needed to transition from civilian to military, from military to civilian life. So here at the Bush Center, uh, we wanted to be a part of a new movement in America that where there's a great outpouring of support for our vets. And we tried to figure out how best to do that. And the best way, a best way to come, of many things we do, but one of them is to help support leaders of, in the private sector and public sector who are helping vets. So veterans have got an enormous capacity to lead if given the help they need. I mean, think about people who didn't go to college but got a PhD in life at a young age. And the leadership traits they have learned in the military. And if given help, will provide those leadership traits uh, to our country. And that's what the Stand To program is all about. I wish you could hear from whether, believe it or not, there's only 43 of them. Get it? <laughs> but all of them are fine leaders in their own right. And your support of these programs really makes a significant contribution to our country. And so we thank you all for being here. Uh, we've got a fascinating conversation with a 
an admiral who was serving during my presidency and afterwards who's had a lot of great experience and is a very smart guy. As a matter of fact, we were just comparing book lists and his was a lot more profound than mine. <laughs> but Jim is a man I, I know you'll respect. You're going to hear from one of our uh, leaders in the Stand To program. In the meantime, know that by supporting these programs, uh, you're supporting something that's incredibly important and incredibly effective. We welcome you here. We thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, I'm leaving. All veterans have the ability to transition successfully, given the right resources. But if the person who wants to apply to this program sees a challenge and they can come up with a solution and this is the vehicle in which it will allow them to accomplish that, then that's when they need to apply. Because it has to be about the greater good. The idea of millions volunteering in the face of danger and millions and millions of people willing to help those who volunteer in the face of danger says the future is very bright. And I believe you're part of that. You're not gonna get this kind of leadership experience anywhere else. It's amazing the talent they bring in to help us learn and grow as leaders. We've seen experts in so many different fields help us as we seek to do good in the veteran space. And the opportunity to travel to the, the Presidential Center in Dallas, to travel to Seattle, to Starbucks headquarters, we went to Amazon headquarters. Washington DC and we visited American University and some uh, Boeing headquarters and just some um, some places where we again heard from people who are trying to solve some of the same problems we are. Be prepared to be put in a position to make a significant impact where with a array of people you'll be able to leave your thumbprint on this lifetime. It brings a, a diversity of thought and a diversity of ideas. Having non-veterans and having um, the veterans from all walks of life, whether they be military officers, whether they be enlisted, whether they be from all the various service branches, it's been very beneficial um, to have uh, a diverse group of people because you're not in the echo chamber and listening to your own opinions, but you are able to learn from others and listening about others' experiences and how that impacts the world. So I'm not a veteran. Um, and at first I walked in thinking, am I gonna fit in? And over the course of just the first few modules, I realized that not only did I fit in and was I accepted truly, even though I've been working in the veteran space for a long time, it was the first time that I really stopped apologizing for not being a veteran or a spouse and really saw the value in how civilians really need to step up and be engaged in this space in a way that can make a difference. As soon as this program ends, we're going to remain a family and help each other out and support each other in whatever way we can. You be the change you want to see in the world. This gives us an opportunity to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2019 Stand To Veteran Leadership Program Scholar, Jen Anthony. It is November of 2011. I'm a first sergeant stationed at Davis Mothin Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. It is a beautiful Saturday afternoon and I'm doing what every good Southern girl ought to be doing on a Saturday afternoon, watching SEC football. <laughs> My duty phone rings, uh-oh. It's the base security forces. There's been a domestic dispute just a few blocks over, and it's my guy, of course. He's an aircraft maintainer. He works 12-hour swing shifts, which pretty much means he comes home to eat and sleep. He has a brand new bride that he's stolen away from her family in South Dakota, and they have two new baby twin girls. They are exhausted, and in a spat, they decide to toss a steel toe boot at each other for a little while, which prompts a neighbor to call the cops. I'll get to the end of this story. Both of them get hauled away in a cop car, and I'm standing in the yard with a baby on each hip, looking eye to eye with an officer from Child Protective Services. In that moment, I reassure her that we're gonna take care of those two babies, 
and we'll get mom and dad all sorted out. I'm happy to tell you that those four characters are doing really well. And in fact, they're still serving in our Air Force. That was my life. I showed up, I took charge, and I fixed things. Fourteen months ago, I retired from the Air Force, and the life of service that it took me 20 years to build came to a screeching halt. In my mind, my career was over. How do you compare to serving for 20 years, living all over the world, spending time in Iraq and Afghanistan with our nation's heroes? What compares to that? I was searching for purpose, and I was longing for the meaning that I had when I wore the uniform. So fast forward to my arrival at the Bush Institute. I'll skip the story about my selection interview that occurred in a lactation booth at the Fort Lauderdale Airport. <laughs> Doesn't seem appropriate here. It's module one, day three, and President Bush has center stage. Poor Miguel is trying to moderate. I'm sure he had some well-planned and thought-out question, and President Bush stops him. And he said, let me just say this. This is a big damn deal. And in that moment, I knew I did not want to let him or anyone else in that room down. My time in this program has provided me with a new sense of purpose and a new calling for service. You see, when you're inside the gates of a military installation, you have no idea that there are people like you out here devoting your lives to our veterans and their military families. And you've welcomed me to this team with open arms. The curriculum in this program has transformed the way I feel and the way I think. But most significantly, it's connected me with a network of amazing human beings who have truly made my life richer. And I know that all 42 of my classmates could stand at this podium and talk to you about how this program has transformed their lives too. As I think about our celebration tonight, I know this is not the end of our journey. It's only the beginning, and I'm really excited about what's yet to come. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Vice President of Communication at the Boeing Company, Gordon Jondro. Good evening, everyone. President and Mrs. Bush, thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, when you run into a, uh, a veteran uh, out on the street or at the airport, you often say, thank you for your service. I really like what Congressman Crenshaw, Texas says. He says, don't say that, say never forget. And we at the Boeing Company uh, never forget. Um, 20,000 veterans out of our workforce committed every day to providing the products and services that our men and women in uniform now need. And then we're committed to helping those men and women and their families, um, spouses, children, so integral to all this. Um, nice to see Laura Stavridis here tonight uh, with her husband. I went along that entire journey uh, with the Admiral. Uh, I'm personally uh, glad to be here, uh, not only to represent the Boeing Company uh, and our support of the Military Service Initiative, as well as the We Lead uh, women's leadership program that Mrs. Bush runs. Uh, but I'm personally glad to support the Bush Center because I had the privilege of working for both President and Mrs. Bush for uh, about uh, a long time and traveled the world with them. Saw them at Bagram Air Base, Assad Air Base in Iraq, Landstuhl Medical Hospital in Germany, and uh, even right here at home, Fort Hood in Texas. I've seen their compassion and caring for so many years uh, and how strongly they feel uh, to not only our men and women in uniform and their families now, but transitioning into a, a civilian life. 
So uh, with that, let me get on to the main event here. Uh, I'm honored to introduce two people who have dedicated their lives to service. Uh, the first, our moderator tonight, Colonel Matt Amidon, the director of the Military Service Initiative uh, here at the Bush Center. And then a man who has devoted uh, more than 40 years uh, in uniform. He's currently an executive at the Carlisle Group. He was the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Uh, he served as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Before that, he ran Southcom. Uh, many other jobs in the Navy. He's currently on NBC News and with Time Magazine. Uh, he's got a book coming out next Tuesday. Go to Amazon.com and get it. Um, uh, and lastly, he's got uh, 58 medals. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Admiral James Stavridis. Thank you all. Sir, good evening. Good evening, Matthew. Ladies and gentlemen, I am truly honored to share the stage with a leader, warrior, and scholar whose uh, long and storied career through ship command to carrier battle group, multiple COCOMs, and SACUR, in and through um, and onward. Um, Admiral Stav, welcome to Dallas, sir. It's great to be here, and uh, Mr. President, Laura, it's wonderful to be in the house again. I, you, you mentioned my whole long misspent youth in the Navy, and I had a, I had a lot of different missions, but um, I do have to just tell one uh, 43 story Please. if I can. Uh, we were down, I was uh, working for Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld when I was a three star, and uh, we came out to the ranch one day to brief the president on a number of different major issues that were kind of bubbling. Uh, working for Secretary Rumsfeld was one of the most entertaining uh, aspects of my life and career, I must say. And um, we came out to the ranch, and we were, it was a very casual setting, and we had, you know, cocoa and cookies, and Barney the dog was running around. But we're trying to brief the president on um, the Aegis missile system, which is a super high-tech missile system. And uh, General Haas Cartwright is doing the briefing, and the president is starting to look just a little, like maybe he's not getting it. And uh, of course, I spent my whole life in Aegis missile defense. And so I'm kind of leaning in like, you know, maybe I can help General Cartwright explain this highly technical matter to the president. And then the president looks up and he looks right at me. And he said, Jim, Barney needs to go out. Can you open the door for him? <laughs> <laughs> I opened the door and let old Barney out. That's how I got a fourth star. In the <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks again for your time, sir. Uh, prior today, previously today, uh, we were on the Strategist podcast as well, so we've got lots to talk about. Um, we've got 32 minutes to take a lap around the globe and talk about your new book as well, so let's, sure. let's get started. You often talk uh, about the global commons and the global commons being challenged, but sometimes the solutions of yesterday not matching the problem of tomorrow. Can you, uh, can you give us some insights there? Sure. Um, let me take you back to uh, a terrible day we all remember very well, of course, 9-11. Um, I was in the Pentagon. I was a newly selected one-star admiral. And uh, as we all know, it's bright, clear, beautiful, morning, and uh, I happened to be on the fourth deck of the Pentagon, glancing out the window, and actually watched the airplane hit the Pentagon. It hit 150 feet to my right, and I'm only sitting here talking to Matthew tonight because it, the plane hit the second deck going down. And so we all did what we could and stumbled out into that grassy field until the real heroes of the day, the first responders, showed up. But here's my point about the global commons. Remember that moment. This was after the Cold War had ended. And we thought, you know, we're kind of headed into this brave new world. And at that moment, what struck me as I stumbled out there was the irony of the fact that here I was by definition, in the safest place in the world, right? 
I'm in the Pentagon. I'm surrounded by massive concrete walls. I'm guarded by the strongest military on earth in the capital of the richest country on the planet. Was I safe? No. I, you know, I saw my share of combat in a long career. That was the most dangerous moment of my life where I was almost killed. And what struck me is in this 21st century, we are not going to protect ourselves by building walls. We have got to understand that we are part of a global community, and we cannot withdraw from it. We cannot come home, build walls here, and think that we will be safe any more than I was safe on that morning in the Pentagon. The world requires engagement, international with our allies, interagency within the government, private, public, Boeing, a company that understands this very well. All of that has to be knitted together. And this, this idea that we can protect ourselves with walls will not work. And I'll, I'll close, Matthew, by pointing out a little bit of history. If you go back about 100 years ago, what happened? We came out of World War I. We brought all of our troops home from Europe, and we decided we were going to be just fine here in the United States. We built walls. They were tariff barriers, Holly Smoot tariffs, because we thought that would give us advantage. How'd that work out? Well, we cracked the global economy. And you can drop a plumb line from those walls, figurative, to the rise of fascism in the Second World War. And I think it's a, a good example of what happens if we withdraw from the world, if we take our idealism and our optimism and just come home. Right. Not going to work. That's why the global commons matter. I appreciate that, sir. And um, I, we had chatted previously today about a former Secretary of State who said, Americans being immoral people want their foreign policy to reflect the values they espouse as a nation. But being a pragmatic people also want that foreign policy to be effective. So to your previous comments about the, the necessity of American presence on the global stage, can you talk a little further about what makes that presence unique and why it's so value added? I can. Um, there are three things that I think uh, the US puts into the international system that matter deeply. And one you mentioned already, it's, it's our value set. It's democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we, we execute those values imperfectly, but they are the right values. And at critical scale, at mass, our ability to move those values into the international system, I would argue, matters deeply. Switzerland is a great country that has many of those values, but they don't have the scale and the mass that we do. Above all, we are still a melting pot. We are still an engine house of immigration and American dream-like success. All those values matter. Second thing, our economy, our trade, our geographic position, positioned between these massive world oceans, benign neighbors north and south, interlocking web of engagement globally matters deeply. And as this 21st century unspools, we have to find a way to coexist with China in that economic zone. And that is, is the challenge of the next decade or so, I think. So the economy is the second. And the third one, and here I'll, I'll start with a shout out to these wonderful uh, veterans, military fellows, wonderful speech by Jen a moment ago, um, our military matters. Not as a, a tool of power, not as a, a means of conquest, but our military matters as a deterrent so that others are not tempted into, shall we say, adventurism. I think those are three things that really matter that we bring to the international world. And I would hate to see those withdrawn. Again, that's why our engagement in the global commons matters. And I'll, I'll close with a book recommendation. 
which is by Robert Kagan, who's a conservative but centrist thinker about international affairs. Short, highly readable book called The Jungle Grows Back about the idea of what happens when the United States, if the United States chooses to truly withdraw those assets from the world stage. With that, sir, um, and considering all of those important uh, elements of American presence, we are bearing witness to events recently uh, in regions around the world, and uh, we'll get right to it, uh, Turkey, Syria, and the Kurds. Uh, with that, uh, our withdrawal from that part of the world, you had mentioned previously that that was an investment with a big swing mm -hmm. based on numbers we had there and the value. Um, what are the consequences, not just there, but, but around the world? Yeah, we had a look at what's happening. Let's, let's start at the strategic level, if you will, and, and just step back and simply observe that this is a collision of ancient empires that's happening before our eyes. This is the Ottoman Empire in its current incarnation, uh, uh, militarized Turkey, invading what was once the heart of the Arab Caliphate in and around Syria and Damascus, and who's fluttering around on the sidelines? Persians, the Iranians. So this is a, a very dangerous confluence of events that's occurring. And we would be well served, in my view, to remain engaged there. Now let's descend to the tactical. It is shameful that we would contemplate walking away from loyal, capable allies in the form of the Kurdish forces with whom we have fought side by side. I can't tell you the number of phone calls, emails I have received in the last few days from special forces operators saying, Admiral, we can't possibly be doing this. I had tea with them. I visited their families. He was my interpreter and saved my life. The scenes we're about to see portrayed are going to be horrific. And so I would argue this region remains vitally important. There are strategic imperatives at play, countering Iran, countering Russia in its engagement there. But there are also deeply personal and tactical reasons we ought to be there. And I'll conclude by saying when, as the Supreme Allied Commander, I had charge of the NATO mission in Afghanistan, we had 150,000 troops there. At the height of the Iraq conflict, we had 190,000 troops there. This is a conversation about two or 3,000 troops. It is a very small investment. It is an example of big doors that can swing on very small hinges. We would be very foolish, my view, to pull that hinge away at this moment. With that, uh, sir, we, we can talk Iran, North Korea, and China, but I, I'd like to point a little further to what you just uh, discussed. Um, now, how does this affect the interaction of NATO uh, and, and the role of Turkey in that? How do, you, how do we hold them accountable? What, what well, as a, as a former NATO commander, and you know, the, the, the best thing about being a former Supreme Allied commander is that your wife calls you Supremo at home. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true. My wife, has, my wife is here, She's though, here. and yeah. I just want to point that out. Um, <laughs> as a former NATO commander who has spent an enormous amount of time with Turkey, as, as you would have guessed from my name, I'm Greek-American. Uh, my family emigrated here three generations ago uh, because of Turkey's invasion of uh, a, a city called Smyrna, today called Izmir, and my family came as refugees here to the United States as a result of this. Um, I spent a lot of time with the Turks. They, like all nations in NATO, they have pluses and minuses. The pluses are very capable, uh, second largest army in NATO, uh, advanced military forces. The bad news is at the moment, those armed forces had been uh, denuded of much of their leadership because of the failed coup attempt against uh, President Erdogan. 
And as a result, it is President Erdogan who is making choices and driving south. Um, universally, this has been condemned by the NATO nations, not only by the organization, by the NATO Secretary General, but by the individual nations, including our own. Um, so the answer to the question, how do we hold them accountable, is we begin by expressing our complete disdain for this operation. Over time, I think you will see sanctions applied. Um, at the moment, the Congress, I think correctly, has built a package of sanctions that is moving toward the White House. Um, and at a personal level, right now, Secretary of Defense Esper and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, newly installed General Mark Milley, are talking to their counterparts. Uh, Secretary Pompeo is communicating to his counterpart. Um, we need to have not only a U.S. set of sanctions and a U.S. response, but we need to take a leadership role in NATO. We have a terrific ambassador there, fine Texan, Kay Bailey Hutchison. My, uh, in fact, my photo and the Ironworks barbecue in Austin is right next to Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. <laughs> So we are buddies, we are barbecue buddies, and we talk a lot. She will put a lot of pressure on through the organization. And I think a combination of personal addressal of these issues, NATO pressure, individual sanctions, and by the way, we ought to encourage other leading uh, economies to inflict similar sanctions. I think all of that will, in fact, cause President Erdogan to at least halt and, and consider not pushing any further than, say, a five-mile zone. And let's get back to negotiating. OK, we can create a buffer zone, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be just run by Turkey. It's going to be jointly controlled. It's going to be uh, humanely run. And it's not going to include uh, a massive blitzkrieg-like operation that attacks our allies who have been carrying the fight against ISIS. I, I see the outline of how this can be resolved, but it's going to require all of those pressure points brought to bear, and Con quickly. Considering those pressure points, sir, and, and the recent um, departure of our forces from, from the Syrian AOR, uh, your, your book, which we'll get to, mentions the voyage of character. How does that departure impact the integrity of the effort as it applies to the, to the Turkey problem? Can I start by just making a, a small distinction here? Because we talk a lot appropriately about leadership, how important leadership is. Leadership is the, the exercise of influence over others. Leadership can be used both for good and for ill. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a phenomenal leader who brought us through the Depression, who brought us through the Second World War. He used leadership in good ways. Pol Pot, Cambodian dictator, was a charismatic leader who energized a society to create massive genocide. Leadership can be used in both ways. Character is leading yourself. It's that inner voyage. It is the hardest act of leadership is to lead yourself. Character is what you do when you think no one is looking. And so I would argue how we treat an ally like the Kurds in the end is a decision of character that we have to make. Yep. The best aspects of our character are our loyalty, our honesty, our ability, our vision, our ability to look beyond the tactical events of the moment. And I'll, I'll, I'll close on this point by saying, um, re recall the Korean War. Very dark days in the 1950s when the United States first was pushed down the peninsula, then came back, and then China reacted again and was pushing us back and back and back. What if the president at that point in the 1950s had said, you know, do we really care about Korea? What's Korea doing for us? Were the Koreans with us at Normandy? Kind of no. Maybe we should just get out of here. That 
would have been a disastrous decision, but we didn't do that right. because we were loyal, because we were honest, because we had vision. And so what occurs? Today, South Korea is the 15th largest economy in the world. It is a staunch ally, partner, friend to the United States. I would argue that elements of character have to be applied to these foreign policy decisions. And, and that doesn't mean you have to be Pollyanna and, and you can't be a realist, but you have to bring some idealism and character to the table. You have to leaven it with realism. When you bring those two things together, you have good foreign policy for the United States. How do you see that um, combination of realism and idealism um, when it's applied to the rise of China? You mentioned a couple things sure. in your tomorrow, the rise of India, the century of biology, yeah. the rise of yeah, women, and yeah. the rise let of me, China. Let me address that. Um, let, me, let me start with a proposition. Let's imagine we are a historian 400 years from now, and we're going to write a history of the 21st century. What are the big themes? The big themes, I would argue, are the rise of China, this alternative vision for organizing a society, a capitalist engine with a totalitarian shell around it. That's a different model than we've seen before. China's rise will be balanced by India's rise. I think the president went to India and said, I bring greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. That was vision at that time. Today, we are beginning to understand the importance of India in sorting through the geopolitics of this 21st century. Second is bio, biology, how biotech unfolds this century in the way that we have just seen information technology, cyber, cybersecurity unfold. It's going to be bio that drives as this century unfolds in everything from materials to energy to human performance enhancement, uh, life expectancy, huge changes. But what we were talking about earlier today, my view of the biggest driver of change in this century, 400 years from now, looking back, will be the rise of women, the rise of women. And the reason is, throughout human history, much of human capital has been parked on the sidelines because of our failure to integrate women fully into leadership roles, into the workforce, and every other way. We've gotten better at that. But I feel that is accelerating dramatically as a result of everything from the Me Too movement to more and more leadership roles for women like Angela Merkel, Michelle Bachelet. We see that rise, and it's, I feel it accelerating. I think that, by the end of the century, will be a significant force. So those three drivers, one geopolitical, China, India, the second technological, biotech, and the third, sociological. I think those three things give me optimism about this century as it unfolds in front of us. So um, as you know, we're, we're big believers in the, the role of women as leaders uh, around the globe. We've, our, my amazing colleagues here at the Bush Institute uh, wrote a, a policy piece about that as it relates to Afghanistan. Yeah. Can you share with us your thoughts about, uh, we have some strong beliefs on the relevance and the continuation of the mission in Afghanistan as it applies to, to those human freedoms? I can. I, uh, as the NATO commander, I went to Afghanistan monthly for four years. And every time I went, I could see the role of women improving. And it, it, it was extraordinary to watch it. And it, it begins with education, which is uh, the most fundamental tool, I think, for creating security ultimately is education. And when we saw young girls go back to school, when we instituted literacy training in the Afghan armed forces, both for men and for women. And by the way, let me tell you something about Afghanistan. If you can read in Afghanistan, you take a pen 
and you put it in your pocket so others can see that you are a literate person. When we would graduate these Afghans from various reading programs, we would give them a pen. You should see the look on a young woman's face, a young man's face, when she or he takes that pen and puts it in their pocket. That is powerful. It has been salutary in the extreme in Afghanistan, and I worry deeply about losing those gains. And again, just as I said a moment ago, the deployment of three or 4,000 troops to Syria is a small hinge that can swing a big door. That mission in Afghanistan was once 150,000 troops. It's now headed toward 9,000 US troops. We talk about withdrawing the troops. We've already withdrawn the troops. 90% plus have come home. So continue the effort, certainly negotiate with the Taliban, but do not give up the gains that we have made both on women, on rights generally, on elections. Do not negotiate those away. Um, the Taliban are deeply unpopular. Poll after poll shows the Taliban are the least popular insurgency in history. Their approval rating is about 9%. To find a comparable approval, you'd have to look at the Congress of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> just to give you just a level set there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have to give in to the Taliban. Yes, sir. And so, yes, we should protect those gains. And I think the world is watching on that one, very much so. Just like the world is watching on the Kurds, the world is watching on how we close out, how we move forward, I should say, in Afghanistan. Uh, last thought, I'm old enough to remember 1975. I was a, still a midshipman at the academy and I watched on television as helicopters were lifting off the roof in Saigon. A month later, people were swimming for their lives to be picked up by Navy destroyers and helicopter carriers at sea. We don't have to do that. No. We, can, we can land this thing. And yes, it requires negotiating with the Taliban, and yes, it requires working with Pakistan. And Ambassador Zal Khalizad, terrific. Um, he needs to be mindful that we do not give up too much too soon in this negotiation. Your recent comment on Congress and the approval rating, <laughs> how do the domestic elements then uh, existing today affect our ability on the global stage? Yeah, what worries me the most about our country, to be honest with you, is, and there are many things to worry about, and there are many things to celebrate about the country, and, and I am, I remain optimistic about the voyage of America. But the thing I worry about the most is the polarization of the country. And of course, that is most vividly on display in the Congress of the United States. It's also vividly on display when you turn on a television set. And whether you are a devoted MSNBC Morning Joe watcher or you are absolutely going to be sitting in your living room every night with Sean Hannity on Fox, here's my plea. Turn on the other channel once in a while. Try and find a sense of what is happening across this increasing divide. And I think as voters, we should be looking for candidates who are capable of closing those kind of divides. I was, well-known fact, I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton, and then improbably I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that as two bullets whizzing by my head. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. But the point, I'm a registered independent, I'm a moderate, I'm a career military officer at the end of the day. I think three things that can help us come back together again, and they're, they're all resident in a place like this. One is education, I mentioned it before, but honest education that teaches us history and civics from the earliest age to the continuing education that 
unfolds throughout our lives. A second is service. Finding ways to encourage others to serve the country. Service is something that we can find common ground on. And, and thirdly is simply small acts of civility. Um, you know, that we've watched this kind of silly controversy over the last couple of days about Ellen DeGeneres and our president. I, really? Uh, we need more of that. We need to celebrate whenever we see people who are willing to reach across the aisle. Uh, I often say about leadership, that, that gift of leadership, in the end is all about listening. It's not about transmitting. It's about listening. And the hardest people to listen to, um, other than your teenage daughters, um, we have two, uh, the hardest people to listen to are your opponents. That is a diminishing skill in American society and one we ought to encourage. And we ought to find leaders to elect who are willing to do that. Yes, sir. I, I think this is a, a nice um, pivot into your most recent book, uh, Return to Civility, uh, The Voyage of Character Alongside Professional and Personal Voyages. Uh, tell us why you wrote the book. So the book is called Sailing True North, and the subtitle is Ten Admirals and the Voyage of Character. As I mentioned earlier, we are awash in books about leadership. It's become a huge cottage industry to write leadership books, and many of them are very, very good. Um, we are underweight in books about that inner voyage, about character. So I wanted to write a book about character, um, and I thought an interesting way to do that, always write about what you know, would be to find some historical figures and look at the challenges that they faced and how they dealt with them. So I look at 10 men and women, admirals, and then I throw in a couple, two, so it's really 12 by the time we're done, and I give a snapshot of each one of them and the challenges they face. And to give you an example, I'll pull a Texan out of the mix, and that would be Admiral Chester Nimitz. If you have not been to the Nimitz Museum here in Texas, Fredericksburg, go and see it. But here's why I highlight him in the book. Here is a quiet, refined, optimistic German-American Texan who becomes an admiral, and he's kind of moving along his career. It's going really well. Pearl Harbor happens. He gets a call, get to Pearl Harbor and take command of the Pacific Fleet. When he arrived in Pearl Harbor and surveyed that beautiful, beautiful body of water in front of him, it was smoking hulls the battleship force, the pride of the American Navy was sunk, smoking. They were pulling bodies out of it when he arrived. The carriers were at sea so that they could be tactically protected. And he took command, not with all the pomp and circumstance of a four-star admiral in his crisp whites on the deck of a battleship. He was in a rumpled set of khakis he'd been wearing for three days and he took command on the deck of a diesel submarine as the smoke and the cordite filled the air. That's resilience. He then had to assemble a team with some of the biggest egos in the world, Douglas MacArthur, Bull Halsey, never saw a reporter he didn't want to stop and talk to. Uh, he managed that team of rivals perfectly and in the conduct of the Second World War, Fleet Admiral, he was a five-star admiral, Fleet Admiral Nimitz never raised his voice, never lost his temper. He was a model of resilience, of civility, of team building. That's a story of character. Yeah, the leadership was important, but at the end of the day, Nimitz's was a story of character. The other stories in the book some are good leaders and good characters, some not so good. Um, so that's the genesis of the book. And I wrote it because I think it's time we thought more about character yes, sir. in our society today. 
Well, we have uh, leaders of character in the crowd as well tonight. We are celebrating the graduation and completion of the second year of our one-of-a-kind Stand To Veteran Leadership Program. Is uh, cohort two in the house tonight? So th these are our true leaders of character who are gonna solve big, big problems for us tomorrow. This nation desperately needs uh, leaders of character. Any closing thoughts or advice for these folks as they, as they move out? I think it's, it's a thought really for all of us that also speaks directly to this cohort. And I'll, I'll begin by saying thank you for your service. And people say that to me a lot, and I really appreciate it. I, was, I wore the cloth of the nation for 37 years as a commissioned officer. And people say that to me a lot, thank you for your service. And I say it to this cohort, thank you for your service. Here's my point. There are so many ways to serve this country. Certainly the military. How about our firemen, our police, our diplomats, our CIA officers, Peace Corps volunteers, Teach for America, Volunteer for America, people working in charitable enterprises all around this country. How about inner city nurses and clinics? How about school teachers in rural South Carolina teaching packed classrooms for $37,000 a year? You think they're serving the country? I do. So here's my point. We should celebrate our military. We should thank them for their service. But those of us in the military and all of us, we ought to be thanking everyone in our society who serves. And we ought to find ways to encourage others to serve because that is what will help us beyond this polarization. So I'll close tonight by saying to all of you who have served in one of those capacities upon which I touched or in the countless other ways you can serve this country, thank you for your service. And thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In, in appropriate military fashion, sir, we will give you coin on behalf of the Military Service Thank Initiative. You. Thank you for your service and for your leadership. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to Admiral Stavridis for being here tonight and for that conversation and for that focus on character. Uh, congratulations to our scholars tonight. This has been a really busy month for us here at the Bush Institute. Not only do we have our scholars here tonight, We've had uh, 60 leaders from across the country as part of our school leadership initiative in town this week. In 10 days, we'll welcome 22 young leaders from Burma as part of our liberty and leadership program. Um, the week after that, we have 150 alumni of our presidential leadership scholars program together. And then two weeks after that, we'll welcome 17 uh, warriors down to Crawford to the ranch to ride bikes with President Mrs. Bush. So we've got a lot going on here at the Bush Institute. We're grateful for your support. Um, let's all go have dinner and we're all going to go to Freedom Hall. Thank you all.